Hello and welcome to Accountant Instruction Help and How To. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the banking system and the financial sector of the economy. We will be able to, at the end of this, list uses of money, list and define what money is and the measures of money, define banks and explain how they are used to create money, explain why the financial sector is so important, and explain the function of interest within the economy. When we start to think about the economy, we usually think about goods and services being exchanged, actual tangible goods and services that we can see being exchanged, things like cars, things like clothes, things like restaurants. We don't think too much about the financial sector oftentimes, even though it will be interrelated with all other transactions that do take place. So many types of the economy we can think of separately. So we could think about the restaurant industry. We could think about the auto industry. Think about them separately. Although they are part of the total economy and the total economy is interwoven in many ways, it is possible to think about a certain section such as the auto industry separately from the full economy in a, sen in a, in a greater sense than we could think about something like the financial sector, which is part of every transaction. So for that reason, we really need to consider the financial sector because it will be part of every transaction. It's not just something separate that we can we can look at individually and specialize in we need to consider it as part of every transaction the reason it can be difficult to think of the financial sector is because it's a bit more intangible things happen that are of value but they're a little less tangible when we think about trading things we think about interest rates we think about charging money on money in, even when times when the money is not even physical it's in a computer system and we're charging interest on money that can seem unusual so it's something we need to drill down on if we think about every transaction however we can see that the currency is going to be important in every transaction if we go if we go out to a restaurant and we get a meal how are we going to pay for that meal with money we're going to give say twenty dollars we're going to get a meal why is it that that individual is willing to accept twenty dollars in order to give us a meal it's not out of the kindness of their hearts obviously it's because they believe that that $20 can then be spent in order to consume something else somewhere else. Why does that individual have faith in the fact that that 20 can then be exchanged somewhere else? Because there's a financial system, because there's a banking system. We need to have that financial system in order to allow money to be some type of exchange. That's what we need to see how that system's going to be put together. You can imagine if we didn't have that system and we went out to eat and we tried to pay for our meal... It would be a lot more difficult. We'd have to trade. We'd have to barter something. We'd have to say, hey, I write accounting textbooks and you do restaurant services. How about we exchange? And we'd have to find someone who would be willing to exchange. Might be, most likely would be, much more difficult if we had to exchange in that way. We would probably be doing less exchanging because of the difficulty and doing a lot more different things on our own, not being able to specialize as much because of this problem in terms of exchange for that reason the banking system really allows us to do the specialization to do what we do best and exchange for the rest when we think about the financial sector and we think about banks we generally think about the idea of money first thing that's going to come to mind what is money how is money going to be used obviously we know that money is going to be used to exchange for other goods that's going to be one of the characteristics of money we can exchange it we can also have the money retain its value. It's going to be a store of wealth. It also allows us to know how much something is worth in relation to other things. So when we think about us buying a meal for the restaurant, we can see that when we exchange the dollars, what's going to happen is the pe person receiving the dollars is going to want to, one, be able to exchange those dollars for other goods. That's why they're going to accept the dollars. They want to be able to use the dollars as a reference to uh, the value of other goods. Notice we're using it somewhat as a measuring stick. When we compare relative goods, instead of comparing them to each other, we compare them to the dollar, kind of like a ruler. Now, the ruler does change because the value of the dollar can change, but it can give us a reference point. If we didn't have that reference point, a lot more difficult for us uh, to value. Also, stores wealth, meaning... If the person receiving the $20 bills or the restaurant receiving the $20 bill does not want to spend the 20 today, then they can put it away and they can spend it tomorrow and not have to worry about the storing of wealth. Those are going to be the characteristics of what money is. 
Now, most of the money now is not within our pockets anymore. It's not even physical money anymore. It's actually going to be money in a computer system. So most of the money that we're looking at in terms of the entire economy is actually not physical in any way. It's going to be within the computer system. This, of course, leads to the question of what is money? What is a dollar bill? If we actually look at the dollar bill, it states right on the dollar bill that it is a Federal Reserve note, meaning it's an IOU from the Federal Reserve. It's an IOU from the government, meaning if we think about the accounting ledger of this, what happens when the government issues money and creates money? It lists out an IOU giving money into the economy, and it has a liability of the IOU. And now once that dollar is in currency, people are willing to ex accept this IOU from the federal in ex the federal reserve from the government in exchange for goods and services the fact that people are willing to accept this iou note in exchange for goods and services makes it currency makes it money how is it then that banks fit into this picture what is a bank a bank's going to be a financial institution whose primary function is to accept deposits so they're going to bring in deposits and they're going to lend out money how do they make money on this we'll get into some more detail of that but if they have the deposits and then they lend out money, they're going to lend out the money at a higher interest rate than they're paying on the deposits that they're going to receive uh, from the investors. We'll talk more about that, but that's going to be the primary function. What, are the, what do they serve to individuals? When individuals get money that they want to store, rather than putting it away and putting it under their mattress, they can then take it to the bank. The bank then provides the service of storing the money. Now, of course, that's a service that the bank's going to need to charge for because they are a business. That charging basically is the fact that once that money is in the bank and it's being stored, they can then loan out a portion of it and receive interest on that. At one time, the deposit into the bank was something tangible, something such as gold. That is no longer the case, and that brings us to the idea of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the system that has the ability to issue the federal IOUs. The Federal Reserve then is the bank that produces the money supplied by creating these federal IOUs. Three characteristics of money, again, are a median of exchange, a unit of account, and a store of wealth. Let's look at those a bit in more detail. We've talked a bit about the medium of exchange. That's what we pretty much most think of when we think of money. What, why do we have it? Because we can buy stuff for it. If we go out to eat, we buy stuff at the restaurant. We can exchange money for it. That's the use of it. And that's going to be very important, of course, because we can imagine if we didn't have the money, then we would be much more difficult to exchange things. So that's going to be a very important function of money within the economy. Money as a unit of account is often something that people don't quite think of as readily, although we use it every time we bring money into the picture. When we compare two items, we usually compare them in terms of dollars just naturally. We compare two things in terms of dollars, and that's just the natural thing that happens. If we did not have money, it would be a lot more difficult for us to understand the relative value of things. We were trying to measure how much a cow is compared to how many uh, units of eggs it takes for an exchange, and we'd have to know the relationship there. And if we did something else, we'd have to know the relationship in terms of the exchange, and it would get very taxing for us to try to compare the relative value of different goods if we didn't have some type of measuring tool. That is what money does. Now, it's not a perfect measuring tool because of the other things that it does and because the money does fluctuate in and of itself. So we have to account for the fact that there is fluctuation within money. But the idea that the money has a unit of account, that we can use it to measure the relative value of goods, is an important function of money. In order for money to be relevant as a unit of measure, notice it has to be somewhat stable. If the money supply does change a lot, it's going to be a lot more difficult for us to be able to use it for comparison. And there's going to be a lot of different examples where uh, markets have decided on units of exchange in order to help out with uh, measuring the value of different items within an economy. For example, in a prisoner of war camp during World War II, the item that was used for uh, accounting in terms of the store of value was going to be cigarettes. So you'll note that if, we wanted, if you wanted something at that particular place, then we would look for the unit of measure being cigarettes. So if you needed some candy or a razor or some fruit or something, it would all be measured in terms of how many cigarettes it would then take in order to come up with some type of unit of measure so that there could be exchange within a market. Money is also going to be a store of wealth. As long as we can use that money in order to purchase other things within the, the market, it's also going to be a store of wealth as well as a median of exchange. 
And that's going to be really important, of course, because that means that we can hold on to the money and we don't have to purchase something immediately after we receive the money. Unlike if we were in some types of barter arrangements, if we traded something for eggs or something like that or apples, we would have to, of course, uh, spend the apples or use the apples at some point in time rather than be able to hold on to them and allow them to store their value. There is a question as to why we would use money to store value. If there's no real guarantee behind money, if money is just a promissory note, why wouldn't we hold something else that has tangible value, the traditional item being something like gold or something like some tangible resource land or something like that? And, and we could hold those things. The problem is that, of course, money, it can be easily used in exchange. So that the value of money is that it's always readily available. So if we have the money there and there's an emergency, we can theoretically take the money out and use it at a, at a given time. If we have something else storing value, such as gold or land or something like that, then it's not as liquid. We can't quite use it as quickly. That's why we might hold on to something like money, even though we know that money is going to devalue over time. We'll talk about interest, of course, interest rates and the deflation of money. We know that, de that the value of money will go down, and it seems counterintuitive then to hold on to money if we know that it's devaluing over time. However, we're, we're holding on to it and for the cost of the fact that if there is a problem, we can exchange that money uh, more readily than we could other types of things, and therefore it's more liquid. And that's kind of the trade-off we have when we're thinking about how to store the wealth in terms of money or some other item. Money is not going to be the easiest thing to measure because things that have the characteristics of money are money. So we said, we said even that the cigarettes were money in certain, in certain circumstances. Different things have been used as money throughout time. And when we measure money, some, we have to try to think about how we're going to include what is in the definition of money. And we can have different uh, inclusive measures in terms of what's going to be included in different levels of measures in terms of money. We call these money that is labeled in M1, category M1, and category M2 money. Category M2 is going to encompass everything in M1, and M1 is going to be more of a limiting uh, function of money. So M1 is a restrictive category. M2 is going to be more inclusive of a category. The M1 category, the most restrictive category, is going to consist of currency in the hands of the public, the checking account balances, and traveler's checks. And the idea of this is that if obviously anything in our pocket is going to be very liquid. That's going to be obviously currency. If it's in our checking account, at this point in time, it's still pretty liquid too because we have debit cards and whatnot and we can spend the currency immediately. And so we have checks and, and that type of thing. So things that are in the bank in the checking account we consider in M1 category. It's important to note that credit cards, on the other hand, are not part of currency. We can, we can use credit cards in order to exchange, but the exchange, of course, is different. Rather, rather than us spending our asset in order to receive some good or service, what is happening is we are incurring a liability, in that case, in order to receive the good or service. So don't get the credit card mixed up with the debit card. The debit card <laughs> means that it's coming directly out of our bank account, that's why the bank account and the checking account and the, and the debit card transaction facilitating the money going out of our bank account is different than a credit card, which is not coming out of our bank account. That's adding to our liability when we purchase something on the credit card. Then we have the category of M2. M2 is made up of everything that's in M1. So M1 is included in M2. Plus, we're going to have savings accounts and money market accounts in uh, M2. Reason being is that savings accounts will be somewhat more restrictive, but we can still go into our savings account and pull the money out fairly easily. So the money is still fairly readily available for us to spend and therefore is in the category of money. Now that we've defined money, let's get back to actual banks, what the banks actually do. And remember, the essence of the banks is that they're going to accept deposits. They're going to put those deposits away, and in order to hold on to the deposits, they're going to loan out money, and they're going to loan out at an interest rate higher than they're going to be giving on the deposits. That is how the banks will be generating money. In order to think about how banks work, let's first imagine that we just have the one bank. Let's imagine we have the Federal Reserve, we have the one bank. How does the bank then make money? All the bank is really doing to make money is generating the note, the IOU, and a liability on their sides of the book. So if they print $100, they put it into the economy, they, put it, they give it to an individual within the economy, and then they have the IOU of the $100. Once that $100 is then spent or traded within the economy, that $100 has now been made currency. It's been made currency simply by the fact that there's an IOU behind it. And that that IOU has been accepted. Why? Through the medium, through exchange. People are exchanging the currency and therefore accepting it as currency. 
we may be thinking, how did this system happen? Why is it that the Federal Reserve would issue an IOU and we would accept it as currency? In order to get through that, we can go through a little bit of a scenario because we know that at one point in time, the deposits within the bank were actually backed by something, typically gold, but other types of things have been used. How is it the fact that at this point in time, the currency that is functioning quite well in many respects is just an IOU from the Federal Reserve? Let's go through a bit of a scenario and just think through a thought pattern in terms of how this process can have or could have most likely did come about. Let's imagine that at one point in time we had currency in the terms of a physical good such as gold. So we were saying that gold is the currency. People are accepting gold in exchange. So we can buy things with gold. We can exchange gold for eggs. We can exchange gold for food. We can exchange gold for clothing and whatnot. If we then get paid in terms of gold, if we received $100 in gold then, we would have to basically hold on to that gold and that gold is subject to be robbed which is kind of not a good thing we want to have that gold be secure if we know somebody that actually has a safe that is more secure than what we have in order for us to feel more secure about our holdings we might go to this individual and say we trust you would you hold on to our gold for basically safekeeping and then have them hold on to the gold providing the service of safekeeping of our resources our gold if you can imagine then later on more people doing this, more people having money into an, an individual or a group's safe in order to keep that gold safe, you can imagine exchange happening later on. What if we went out and we bought a horse or something and we had the $50 worth of gold that we wanted to exchange? Well, if we did that exchange, then we'd have to go to this person and pull out our gold and pay the other person for the horse. We'd get the horse. What are they going to do with the gold? They're going to take the gold and go back to the same person that we just took the gold out of, give it back to that individual, and put it right back into the bank. So that's two transactions to and from the bank that really don't need to be there. We could have just said, hey, I have the gold in the bank, and uh, you're going to put the gold back in the bank. Why don't we just make an agreement saying that gold is now yours, and we don't need to be going and dragging gold around where we can get robbed and whatnot. And so that's basically what can end up happening. Then the person holding the gold can then basically say, hey, I'm just going to give you a note saying that I, you know, I'm recognizing that you have this much gold there. And then you can exchange the note rather than the actual gold, the note then being backed up by actual gold. But what you are exchanging won't be actual gold for these reasons. You don't want to get robbed or anything. And that and that will be the median of, of exchange. So then you can exchange in that format. Now that note, the receipt of the of the gold being in the bank is now what we are using in terms of currency at that point in time. At this stage in our story, we can say, well, the receipt is now money, but we're kind of on like a gold standard, of course, because that receipt is backed up by physical gold. You can imagine at a later time, the person that storing all this gold, you can see we have this, this safe with all this gold that never is being taken out, except rarely that people would come in and actually take the gold out of the safe. You can see the thought process in there being, well, I have all this gold, there's all this gold in the safe, and it seems like it's just being wasted. We're just holding the gold there, and the only thing that's being exchanged are these notes. We can then imagine someone going to the individual holding the gold in the safe saying, hey, you know what, I need a loan at this point in time. I've got this good idea. I need a loan. And the person holding the, the gold is saying, well, you know what, I've, if I have $100 worth of gold, 100 worth of gold in here, and people only draw out up to about 10% at any given time, we can give a lot more banknotes at this point in time than there are actual gold within the safe. So the, so the person holding the gold can say, well, yeah, sure, I'll give you a, a gold note, and that's fine because that not, it, unless everybody at, some, at the same time draws the gold out at the same time, then there's not going to be a problem. But at that point in time, what has now happened, of course, is currency has been created that is no longer fully backed up by the gold that is actually in the safe at this point in time. So money has been created in excess of the actual gold in the safe. As long as there's not basically a run on the bank, as long as everybody doesn't uh, go to the bank and say, uh, we want all our gold at this point in time, probably not a problem. If that did happen to happen, of course, there could be a problem because there'd be lack of faith within the system in that point and there's not enough gold to pay off all the receipts that are currently outstanding within the economy. 
as you can imagine, this practice can be very profitable. If we're taking money into the bank and we consider that we can hold on to a very small portion of it and still meet the needs of individuals and then loan out uh, based on the, the holdings that we have, then we can make interest on the, on the loans and that could be a very profitable area. Other people could then try to do the same thing, basically uh, allowing to hold on to the deposits in that case and making loans in the same in the same way and now we basically have the banking system a banking system at that point a banking system that is not backed up by something tangible such as gold a banking system that is partially at that point backed up by something tangible such as gold although the currency that we have is not backed up by gold it's backed up by the IOU it functions in the same way when we have that money that is out in the economy as long as people are willing to exchange for that money it is then currency when we put that money into the bank, it's a similar function as putting the gold into the bank. It acts as the same function. And then when we draw that money out of the bank and exchange it, then it's acting, of course, as currency at that point. For example, let's say that we put $100 within to the bank and the bank would then say, you know what, we're going to hold on to $10 of that and we're going to basically invest 90 of it. So of the 100 only 10 is remaining in the bank. We call that the reserve. And why is it remaining in the bank? Because obviously that's going to take care of the day-to-day -day operations, people that need to draw money out. The other 90 is going to be then invested. That's going to be the idea of the banking system. This would mean, of course, that we have a reserve ratio of 10%. We're, we're reserving 10% of the $100 that were deposited at that point in time. What would be the proper reserve uh, ratio? How much should we reserve in terms of the total deposits? That is up for debate, and that's one of the things that the Federal Reserve has control over. The Federal Reserve requires a certain amount of a reserve ratio. Now, the bank, the individual banks, can reserve more than that reserve ratio, and if there's times of panic, if there's uh, times of recession or times of trouble, banks will often decide, and they have decided recently and after the events in 2008, to have higher reserves than are required by the Federal Reserve. What then is going to happen to that $90, that $90 that is then loaned out? Well, the $90 was loaned out to someone that, of course, wants to spend it. That means that what is out in the economy now? Well, there's the original $100 that uh, we put in there that uh, we can spend, and there's now the $90 that is now out in the economy. $10 is still in the reserve. Therefore, there's $190 out there. $90 has just been made by this transaction by the bank. Then, of course, that $90 will be spent. So let's say they went out to eat or whatever they're going to, whatever they got the $90 for. And the $90 will then eventually, whoever receives that $90 may then put that $90 back in the bank. The, now, the, now the bank now has the $90 again. It's been returned to the bank at this point in time. Well, what is the bank going to do with that new $90? They have their reserve ratio. So they're, they're going to hold on to 10% of it and they're going to loan out the rest of it. Therefore, it lends out $81, it keeps $9, same process happens, whoever they lend out the $81 will then spend that at some point in time. And again, if we're imagining just the one bank there, we know that, the, or the whole banking system as a whole, we know that that, that money eventually is just going to come back to the bank, same process then ends up happening, we can see how money is basically being generated through this process. If we added up this process, and we saw that the money was coming back every time, and we added up and we took 10% of it, we can come up with a function to decide how much uh, of money will be created by basically that $100. This is, of course, a simplified calculation, a simplified model when we calculate how much money would be generated from the $100, because we know that individuals could save some of that $100, and there could be changes to the reserve within the banking system, but it gives us an idea of the types of multiplying effect that money could have through this process when we generate the money through this process. It also tells us that if the reserve changes, then that can change the amount of money that's going to be out in the system. For example, if the, Fed, if the bank then increased its reserves from 10 to 15, meaning it's holding 15 of all the deposits, what will that do? it will generate less money because the bank is now holding on to money, holding on to larger reserves rather than putting them back into the economy. And that's going to mean there's less money in the economy. Now, from the Federal Reserve standpoint, remember <laughs> that they have the minimum reserve. They set the minimum reserve, which in good times is usually what the bank will then go by. They'll go by whatever the Fed says is the minimum reserve. That's what they will keep as the minimum reserve. And that means that the Federal Reserve has some leverage, some control over how much money 
is in the market. Now, again, the calculations of how much money is in the market and how much money will be generated through the process of changing the reserves is not as simplified as the calculation that we've talked about here, but we do have some control over that if the reserve uh, can be adjusted by federal policy. Now, if the banks are holding on to reserves that are higher than the federal policy, then of course the Fed doesn't have as much control over that because, because once they change the reserve level, it's, it's not up to where the banks are at anyway, so it's not really having an effect at that point in time. It's interesting to note that our banking system was, of course, backed up by gold at one point in time. And then we did have this same similar problem where there were more IOUs, more federal IOUs out there than were being backed up by the gold. And then sometime in the 1930s, it was basically the illusion was basically taken away just to basically say the currency is no longer being backed by gold at this point in time. It's the only thing that's guaranteeing the currency is the promissory note from the federal government, from the Federal Reserve. From this process, we can imagine the idea of inflation. And that is the fact that if the financial ex sector expands the spending flow too much, that can cause inflationary pressure. That means that there's gonna be increased prices for goods and services. If on the other hand, it contracts the spending flow too much, you get a recessionary period. Why does this happen? Because if there's more money out there chasing the same amount of goods and the, and the increase in the money supply hasn't increased with the same level of production, then there's going to be more money out there than there is actual product in terms of increase in production. That means the products are going to demand more money for the actual products and vice versa. If the money supply is slowing down and say actual production is going up, then there's less dollars around that are out there to get the output that is actually increasing and that can create a problem. This leads us back to the idea of what interest is. What are interest rates? Interest rates are the prices that are charged or paid for the use of financial assets. So when the bank gets the deposits, they then loan out money. They loan out money in order to receive interest. Now, because interest is something that is intangible, it's hard to see, and it's kind of difficult to see what the banking system is doing, interest rate has gotten kind of a bad name at certain points throughout history. Interest rates has, has been thought of to be a negative thing. However, it, we can see that it's going to be crucial to the success of, of any type of economy because it's going to be part of the backbone to the banking system. So we have to have that uh, interest charge within there so that the banking system can be used in order to keep our machine of the economy moving.